And I know it sounds like I'm invalidating a lot here, but I do think there comes a point where it's like, we need to be able to say, well, not everything is valid. I don't think everything is justifiable. I'm spilling the tea for you today. Uh, well, this is coffee actually. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ella. And for today, we are going to be talking about a little bit more of a serious topic, I suppose. Um, about social media, witchcraft, um, and a couple of just like community issues, I guess you could say, uh, from like imposter syndrome, FOMO, grifters, uh, you know, consumerism, and like all of that. So, what is this? This is a bit of a tag. Um, essentially, Joanna, um, Polish folk witch made this really great thought piece on her Instagram story. I think that was already in January. And it was really, really good. It was a really, really great conversation. There were like, you know, the Q and A type of thing where people were able to share how they feel. And it was just such a great thought piece um, on, you know, these topics. And um, then Leah, the redheaded witch and I were like, oh my God, this is so, like this, this conversation is so good. Um, and it's been things that, you know, we both have had feelings for um, or like emotions had, you know, kind of like arisen um, and we both were like, this is, you know, such a necessary conversation to have. And so then essentially us three, so Joanna and Leah and I came together and we were like, let's make a tag. Um, and so of course the tag is Occult Tea. Now it's a little bit of a funny giggle, you know, type of tag. However, um, it is supposed to be like a little bit more of a serious undertone. We were struggling with finding a tag, y'all. <laughs> like, uh, I kept being like exposing witchcraft. It was shut down. Um, it's fine. So essentially what this is, is we kind of just wanna um, talk about, you know, these issues in the community with the community with the community, of course, duh. Um, so essentially everyone here, you're welcome to, please uh, go join us in this tag, make a video uh, for YouTube if you have that or Instagram or like a blog post, a podcast episode, whatever format works for you. We're doing like a little bit of a call um, to action, <laughs> I guess, for everyone to join in this and share how you feel with this um, situation. Cause I feel like this is a little bit of a collective uh feeling at the moment but yeah so the questions can be found in the description box below it is one of those public patreon posts so you don't have to be patron or anything like that to access it um it's just that the description box has like a word count on it um so that's why we did that um and obviously we're kind of hoping for if this discussion kind of picks up um we were thinking of doing like a live panel where we could have, you know, like a little bit of a back and forth with other members of the community. Um, but we'll see how that goes down the line. So I'll just go, I'm just going to read to you the topics that we've got going um, for this uh, tag. So I also made a Patreon exclusive video that I filmed yesterday. Um, am I like way too far from the camera? Should I be more like this? I think that's better. So we essentially, um, I already filmed this yesterday, but like more chatty, more like rambly. Um, whereas this is more like the actual tag questions. Uh, it's a little bit more organized. So the topic one or first topic is the impact on the community. Um, then we've got influencer authenticity. Then we have imposter syndrome and FOMO. And then we have capitalizing off of the community and then of course the conclusion. So strap yourself in, get yourself a cup of tea or coffee. This mug here is, is from the British Museum, by the way, in case any, I get questions about it um, every time I show it. And yes, so. But yeah, let's get right into this. Oh no, wait, I forgot. <laughs> this is something I forgot yesterday as well in the Patreon video. 
is to introduce yourself. So, introduction. Introduce yourself. How long have you been practicing, oh no, participating in the witchcraft online space? What practices and topics do you discuss primarily? All right. Hello, welcome, my name is Ella. Um, I am 26 years old and I am, I live in Germany, in Bavaria, and I'm a German folk witch. Uh, how long have I been participating in the witchcraft online space? I cannot remember. I think YouTube I started posting, I wanna say 2018, I think, or maybe 19, or maybe, even earlier 17 something along those lines i need let me just go check i don't know why i'm like yesterday i did the same thing i was just like guessing um let me check my because i have a couple of videos that are like older that i have deactivated because they are misinformation which feeds really well into this video um and i say that like, you know, so six years ago was my first ever video. So I've been posting for six years on YouTube. Um, and at some point I moved over on Instagram as well. I think that was a year or so after. So five years ago or something like that. Um, but yeah. Um, and I've been practicing witchcraft for longer than that. I say practicing. Um, I grew up as a Wiccan. Uh, like in a very witchcrafty, you know, open family. Um, however, you know, take that with a grain of salt, obviously, considering um, I think with folk magic, for example, I kind of came to that uh, a little bit later um, in like 2020, 2019, 2020 is when I kind of moved more towards folk magic, um, probably more 2020, to be honest with you. Um, I was still doing some Wic Wiccan videos by that time too. Um, so yeah, exactly. What topics and practices do you discuss primarily? So I started with Wicca. I started posting um, Wiccan videos and Wiccan content. And then in the last three years, I think, I started posting a little bit more folk magic, specifically German, specifically Bavarian um, folk magic. And... Um, a little bit of traditional witchcraft as well here and there. So, first question with impact on community. Also, I see my camera is only got one bar left. So we'll see how long we make it. And I'll probably have to go run, charge the camera, come back. We'll see. So what is my personal reasoning and inspiration behind sharing my practice online? Okay, so I started off with... Um, wanting to so i remember when i first started practicing not practicing when, well yeah practicing too when i first started practicing that was right around the time that people were starting to get into youtube um and there was just no witchcrafty content so when it did start popping up a little bit here and there it was people that i would watch but i just never felt fully relatable to them like i always was like mm, it's not exactly how i you know would see it or like you know just I, I don't know that was kind of like what was going on back then in my mind and then i have always loved photography and i've always loved kind of um art and everything like that and i decided um, and thought you know and like home videos and so i kind of was like you know this kind of thing would maybe be fun let's just try this out um you know and it kind of took off from there it was obviously very unexpected um but that was my initial inspiration now as for right right now my reasoning and my re inspiration it's more um connecting so i think over the time it's shifted to and that kind of came with time of course um i really appreciate the friendships and the connections i've made um i also personally learn a lot from the community members um and my practice has shifted so much i feel like so you know i i'm a consumer as well um and so posting for me is a little bit of a creative outlet. Um, I, whilst I do make like some educational content, I guess, you know, like witch tips and stuff like that. Um, I try to see it more as like an art form. Um, 
and I do enjoy like the occasional more um, serious approach to a to a post for example but I think Instagram in particular is probably not the best platform for it because it is so short form. Um, YouTube is where I usually tend to do more educational sort of stuff uh, and I just like I like just talking I guess. <laughs> um, I find myself being very just drawn to uh, yeah talking about the stuff that I enjoy and that I like and I guess it's kind of coming from there. What am I looking to achieve by participating? Do I seek to educate, learn, or connect? Yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> so all three, I don't try to educate as much anymore. Um, I just like sharing, I think. And I mean, obviously there is a level of education to that, you know, like, what are you sharing, you know? Um, I try to focus more on like the things that I have been interested in and so kind of more like this is what I've kind of found however I do prefer and I you know do have a bachelor's in anthropology so therefore I like and I feel like I mentioned this in every every damn video um but I do like having a little bit of an academic approach to certain topics so uh a little bit of education I do enjoy as well especially in like the articles that I write and so on how do I believe social media as a whole has impacted the community this is really interesting um, because, and I guess this is potentially hard for someone who maybe wasn't in a community before. I was never part of a community outside of before, let's say, before social media. I was in a um, which community in New Zealand, there was a coven, um, but beyond that, and like, I remember when I was younger, I tried in high school, uh, I tried to like, well not tried, but like people would obviously, my friends would obviously be curious, like what is this thing that I'm doing? And I would explain it to them and then they'd be interested and then we'd have a little coven for a month and then they kind of fell out of it, uh, you know, fair enough. But um, I think the social media conversation is really interesting because there's a lot to be said about the impact where social media I feel like has on the one hand given witchcraft um, like a broadness like a accessibility level where more and more people were able to join um, or discover it or find it for themselves that perhaps previously hadn't been um, then you've got you know the conversation around I feel like one that people kind of overlook is community guidelines and my husband actually mentioned this yesterday because we were talking about this again. And it was really interesting, especially with TikTok. That made a big impact on our community, I think, and how we see things and how we do things. And specifically the TikTok community guidelines. Because on TikTok, when you shared a video, you were not able to show knives or fire or blood, of course. Um, there were so very specific guidelines, animal parts. Many, many of the integral things of witchcraft were substituted in these videos. Um, and I think it actually like became that way, you know, these, these substitutions for videos became actual substitutions for people in their like actual practice or rather people thought that because that's what they saw on TikTok, especially the younger audiences who, or people that were new, they perhaps didn't realize that it was a substitute and then they it's just kind of transformed into that. Um, it was really interesting. But I think people have, on the one hand, been able to see more practices and see more varieties and we've had great conversations about like the cultural differences um, and nuances and like, you know, conversations around what is appropriate and what is not appropriate to you know, even practice for yourself at times. Um, and then you've also got the other side of the, the coin where it's like, and then people exploit that, of course. There's a lot of like grifting and capitalization going on on witchcraft. There's a lot of watering down. Um, there is, again, conformity for various reasons. So I think social media has definitely made a big impact on witchcraft, um, on the community. <laughs> How do I believe, oh, no, no, no. 
How do I think social platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube have each impacted education, sharing information? Well, TikTok, I have a little bit of beef with TikTok. Um, and I'm not on TikTok anymore. I tried it um, for like a year or two, and I think a year, and then I was like, nah, this ain't it. Um, so I think TikTok has done a number on our community and on like the sharing of information because it has killed people's attention span. I don't know what psychologically went on, but even in my YouTube video views, like you could, you could make a video like a few years ago that was like 30 minutes long and you have great views. And now videos are like five minutes and they're like, mm, you know, like, ooh, like 15 minute videos is probably where I'm like, like in myself, I see it too, you know? Uh, I feel like TikTok has done a number um, for a couple of reasons. TikTok has been a really big factor in misinformation, in my opinion, um, just because of the nature of it. You cannot possibly make a well-educated video in under a minute. Like you can't give sources, you can't actually give new ones, you can't give context. Everything has to be snapshot. You have to, you know, like wrap the view viewership. Um, it had to be kind of like sassy. It had to kind of be like triggering you as a viewer to stay on the app. So therefore it was very, you know, in my opinion, not the best for it. I think TikTok was like a fun platform, but because obviously people did try to kind of share um, and have a little bit of educational sort of stuff on there. Um, I think that did a number on it. Um, Instagram, I think is a very visual platform. I feel like it's kind of like Pinterest in that it is a lot of very aesthetic sort of stuff. And I think that's where a lot of the consumerism kind of comes from because people and selling stuff, you know, especially because Instagram has kind of moved more towards being like a selling platform. Um, I think Instagram is a beautiful platform, aesthetic platform. It's very visual, but there's the downside that people kind of were like seeing all these very pretty altars, very pretty uh, tools and very pretty everything, you know, and then they think, oh my gosh, I have to have all of these things. They have that FOMO of like, like, oh, I need that spell candle, otherwise, you know, like I have it, you know, those seven day candles, the glass ones, you can't, I can't, I've never seen them in Europe. I, I cannot find them unless they're like relatively expensive on like online. Um, a couple of shops do carry them, but you know, they're not like in your local stores here or anything like that. Whereas in America, they're everywhere and I constantly see them and I'm always like, I want those too. Um, even though they're probably not even that practical, but <laughs> I don't know, you know, you get that sort of thing where you see something oftentimes enough um, that you want it. And that's of course a big, you know, marketing technique for selling stuff, um, be it books, be it, be it, you know, products and things like that. Um, so you definitely have that, I think, on Instagram. Also, I feel like people tend to not read long captions, um, especially with the reels kind of being really, really popular. Um, again, they tend to be under 30 seconds long. They're very visual. They tend to be like a little snapshot of like whatever you're trying to like, you know, post about. Um, and then the captions a lot of times go overlooked or the captions are just like where you throw in the hashtags and that's about it. Um, YouTube, I think, is the best one in terms for like where you can find good education. Um, I think you just got to dig for it a little bit. Um, I know YouTube, for example, is a platform where you are actually, you're able to find professors talk about certain topics. Like I love watching Ronald Hutton. Um, he has talks. You can find them on YouTube. They're free. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, so I think YouTube is the best in terms of like long format content. However, the views have definitely tanked over the past few years. So, is consuming witchcraft content becoming a substitute for practice? I think so, yes. I think people are, I'm gonna say something a little bit of, um, maybe ruffles some feathers. Uh, I think a lot of people pretend. I think a lot of people don't actually believe what they post. I don't think, like there's a couple of people where I'm like, they are so contradictory in what they post or so shallow not in a type of way where it's like where you can't post a dissertation on Instagram. Don't get me wrong, I get that. However, there's times where I'm like, you can just feel that this person is using like Pinterest as a source, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Not to be too shady, but I feel like there is definitely people that 
have used Instagram to create an image of themselves of being a very knowledgeable practitioner and it's probably not actually the case. Um, I also think a lot of people present themselves as being much more connected to their craft when it's probably not even like that and I think they use their altars or use their space as a little bit of a stage. Um, but yeah, I do think people are more on their phones these days than they are actually practicing. I think people consume more than they actually put into practice. And I say this even with myself, I sometimes see it where I have phases where I consume more content and I read about it more than I actually practice it. And I think that is a slippery slope and I don't think that that is, you know, that's not real, it's not supposed to be the point. Like, we're supposed, we're, we're constantly consuming and we're never actually putting what we consume into practice. And it's like, you can't even retain the information that you're consuming. It's just kind of like this automated scroll. Um, that's just kind of constantly going on. And it's like, that's not actually, you know, how, like how often do we spend all day on our phone or half the day on the phone? And it's like, when was the last time that you, without your phone, actually, practiced witchcraft you know like when was the last time you actually went out into the forest and did a spirit summoning or you actually did a tarot reading that you didn't film <laughs> or you know like what have you i feel like that's a lot of times going on for sure okay so my camera did in fact die so <laughs> um the light might look a little bit different um because i was just waiting for the camera to charge again but the next section that we had was influencer authenticity. So um, out of what I share on social media, how much of it is staged versus reality? Um, personally, just gotta make sure I'm looking focus. Personally, uh, most of it is staged. Uh, simply for the fact that I don't feel comfortable sharing actual spell workings or rituals. Also because they tend to be, like first of all, they're private. Um, I've got spirits employed that I, they don't want to be shared. I don't want to share them. Um, also my actual workings, I would not film that because of like the way that energy flows um, and raising energy takes a lot more than what I would be filming. Uh, there's a couple of things that go into it, but for the most part, it's just privacy reasons. Um, and for the most part, the stuff that I post is um, like a, what's it called? Um, not a Yes, it is a performance, but it is a showcase of how you would do it. It's not the actual spell, like it's not me actually doing it. Um, there's a specific term for that. Like when you, what's it called? I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, so most of it is staged. The only time that I occasionally have posted something that isn't staged necessarily is tends to be more picture format. But even that, it's there's a level of stagedness. Just simply for the fact that Instagram is such a visual app. Um, and I see it more as like an art form. I see it more as like, um, yeah, creating something that is like, you know, photography type. Do I think there is an element of censorship in online spaces? How do I decipher what is appropriate to share online versus what to keep privately? Is this based on social media etiquette or a personal preference? Yes, there definitely is a um, certain censorship. And I think this is a really, really interesting topic. So I think there is a couple of ones that we need to discuss. The first one and the easiest one is community guidelines. Depending on what platform you are on, you're gonna have community guidelines that include, for example, not posting content that is gory or that has blood, um, sexual nature. Um, you're not gonna see me being able to post things like blood or posting things like, uh, you know, just th that type of stuff, just due to community guidelines. I mean, I remember on TikTok, you couldn't show knives, you couldn't show fire. Like if you had a candle in your video, that got flagged. And so that obviously created like an entire shift within 
what content you're able to post and I think it changed the content itself as a matter of fact. Um, but also then you have, um, so for example, Patreon is 18 plus for my Patreon, uh, simply because I do have more adult themed content. It's not like sexual, um, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but it is, for example, like I will mention more blood or I will mention urine or I will mention, um, you know, things that perhaps are not like appropriate for Instagram. Um, but how do I personally, um, also then I think there's a community censorship. So as I, and this kind of prompted a lot of this for me personally too, I recently made a reel um, saying witchcraft isn't for everyone and I stand by that and I think a lot of the comments prove the point um, of that video where first of all I showed a chicken foot which is actually, wait where is it? It's, it's here, there it is, that there. I showed these chicken feet, um, which was more so meant as a background video for the actual topic. It wasn't necessarily to be like, if you don't work with chicken feet, you're not a witch. Like that wasn't the point. Though some, I think, understood it like that, which is kind of missing the point. Um, but I think witchcraft spaces online are very fluffy, are very beginner level. I think they kind of don't have a lot of depth, especially on Instagram. The content that I've seen with my personal stuff that performs the best are easy, beginner-friendly, non-offensive type um, witch tips. And it's like, you know, and I am, I'm honestly, quite frankly, over it. I did that for a while. Uh, I didn't mind it. But I'm over it at this point. Like there's just how many times are we going to post these very... I don't know. I feel like I'm just... I'm personally over it. I feel like there's enough of it online. I don't need to add to that any further. Um, you know, like I don't mind it. But... and I have no problems per se with it. But I just... I'm personally just over it. Um, and unfortunately that's the type of content that does really well so though. So I think there's a, set, a certain level of censorship in terms of if you actually post something that is a little bit more, you know, different, um, not to say advanced, because I know advanced is like kind of a vague term, but just something that I think is probably going to ruffle some feathers. So where I, for example, would use animal parts or I would use things that first of all community, community guidelines probably wouldn't allow it but also I think the community members um, and the consumers probably would not engage with it or be you know not happy with it um, so for example the devil in the craft I got some heat for that too um, I find this really interesting because in in my opinion, not only in my opinion, if you look at any historical like sources, there is a devil in the craft. I know there's this 90s and 2000s idea of, and it's very like Wiccan coded, even though it's not from like different topic. Anyway, um, not to bring up Wicca, but people think that there is no devil in the craft. And that kind of goes into like, oh, there was the satanic panic. And so kind of, you know, uh, witchcraft kind of got rebranded a little bit to be a little bit more like harm none and like you know oh we're so kind we're nice and we would never harm a fly it's like that's really historically speaking not true um there's been so many records of you know cunning folk uh using various methods that nowadays i think a lot of people that consider themselves witches would really really shy away from um be grossed out by or even quite terrified by and that type of content i don't see doing well on instagram and i don't see that you know if i did post more of that type of content um i think people would report it I think people would flag it uh, and not just witchcraft community members but I think um, there's for example Christians or other um, Abrahamic religions um, that would see that and be like this is terrifying I'm going to report this and so I think there's a level of censorship with that going on too for sure. Um, so therefore I keep it private. <laughs> Um, though I would like to talk a little bit about it more on my Patreon. I feel like in theory, I think it's not a bad thing to discuss um, and would like to do a little bit more of that as a matter of fact. 
Have I ever encountered or heard of grifters in our community? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this is a big thing at the moment. And I think this is one of those things that personally bugs me a lot. I feel like there is a couple of people that, again, they don't believe what they're actually posting. Also, hello, sunshine. Um, I think there's a lot of people that uh, are just, they kind of were there for the aesthetic, um, which, you know, fair enough. And then they are now turning into consciously or unconsciously into grifters. They are pretending to be something that they're absolutely not and then they're trying to sell you their $40 candles or their $150 witch sets that should really not, like there's no justification for that price. Um, or they're just, you know, trying to make a buck out of it. They're, they're clinging on to whatever opportunity is thrown their way that makes them money, uh, regardless of if it actually serves the community, regardless of um, if it actually makes sense to partake in that type of, um, you know, whatever it is. And I think you can tell even because of the fact that big companies are taking note of our community. I was talking with Leah about this yesterday. There is a specific company that definitely is taking note of our community. But what I mean to say is there's companies that are taking note of our community because it is getting like a bigger community. I remember it even was one of those trending ones on TikTok. And companies are taking note and they are seeing us as a profitable, like, community to profit off of and like make money off of. I remember a couple of years ago made a like witchy beginner kit and it had like white sage and I think like a bunch of like little essential oils and I don't know if they actually ever went through with it but there was a big boom and like big companies like even I think they had like bracelets that had like tarot cards and like other occult themes um on them so they're definitely taking note and I think it's going on in our community too. Like there is a couple of people that I can think of at the top of my head immediately who I know also due to personal interaction with, with them that they don't believe in this. They are learning and teaching as they go. Uh, you know, they're, they're teaching you the stuff that they just learned yesterday and they are making themselves seem like these educators and they're definitely not. Uh, and, or they're, you know, like just straight up at this point lying like i've seen people straight up lie and it's really really annoying and frustrating because you can't even call them out i feel like you can't even bring criticism forward because they will spin the narrative they will call everyone around them a narcissist and they themselves are this poor little victim that are so kind-hearted um <laughs> And it's really, really frustrating because there's not much you can do, especially because they have surrounded themselves with people that only know their narrative and that will, of course, naturally, as, as most friends do, protect their friend. And so even if one would bring up, hey, hold on a second, what you're doing is capitalizing off of the community and what you're doing is lying and what you're doing is not right, um, and it's just morally and ethically like not not right and not fair. Um, they've kind of created this little mm, circle of like protectors, let's say, that they also are using and they also are manipulating. <laughs> and this is entire like it's really really frustrating essentially. Um, also, there comes a point where even if a community member is doing something that might seem a little bit like iffy let's say it's almost like like imagine this is like a workspace and these are your colleagues calling out let's say a colleague for what they're doing is always uncomfortable and it's always going to come with a level of like discomfort and awkwardness and like how do you go about it um it's just really, really tricky to work through that, in my opinion. How do I recognize them? What are significant signs of grifters in the community? In my opinion, there's a couple. However, I feel like I'm probably not very good at explaining this, so I'm wondering what uh, Joanna and Leah are going to say about this. For me personally, I feel like I get red flags when someone has just learned something and then they immediately go on to sell it. And they immediately capitalize off of what for them is just a hobby, um, presenting themselves as something that, or more, more knowledgeable than they are, um, especially 
But this is of course with a layer of like, I have a personal understanding and back, back kind of ground understanding. Um, so it's a little bit easier for me to know if they're a grifter or not. Um, a, a consumer that doesn't have that sort of like background information might not. Um, I feel like there's a couple of practitioners that will say I've been practicing um, since I'm like, or for like 20 years. And it's like, you are 30. I understand, because I also grew up with Wicca. However, I feel like it is, there is a level of like people presenting themselves as much more educated, and much more knowledgeable than they are, you know, and just like, just because you had an imaginary friend as a child doesn't make you this long lasting witch that, that, that is the reason why it's justifiable for you to sell $100 candles. Um, especially considering most kids have imaginary friends, like it's just kids having creativity. <laughs> um, and I know it sounds like I'm invalidating a lot here, but I do think there comes a point where it's like, we need to be able to say, well, not everything is valid. I don't think everything is justifiable. And I think that is a big part of it, especially when you do see people um, clearly making money out of something that has no justification why it is this expensive, you know, especially if it is like reselling of something. Like um, I've seen those copper cauldrons, for example, that I myself have, and I myself would love to um, eventually have like a little antique section in our shop, but there's no justifiable way of you selling that at 10X of a price, you know, like there, there is no justification for that. Um, and so there's a, ki a kind of those kind of signs um, also, if they hop from trend to trend, if you see them kind of changing every few weeks or every few months and then immediately selling you that or immediately trying to like make money out of that in some way, I feel like that's a big sign too. Um, because then I feel like it's not bone deep, you know. Um, that to me is a big sign. And then I think just general vagueness. I think just when they are using terminology that doesn't make sense in the context of what they are writing. It is completely shallow. It's misinformation a lot of times. And then again, they're selling you that misinformation. Like if they're trying to sell you a course or if they're trying to, you know, sell you or educate you in some way. And it's like very clearly misinformation. You can tell this person doesn't actually have the knowledge than the basis for this, for selling you this, you know? Um, I think that's a big red flag too. Uh, what tools are helpful to decipher misinformation and how can we as a community prevent widespread misinformation? This is difficult because it kind of goes into what I was saying earlier with holding community members accountable is really tricky. Um, what tools are helpful to decipher misinformation? First of all, Google, <laughs> obviously. So if you see a person talking about witch bottles, um, for example, they are based in historical um, like research that is easy for you to look up and read a couple of different articles and like see what historians, archaeologists, anthropologists have said about this, um, what other practitioners have said about this. It's very easy to dispel misinformation about that, for example. Um, it's also very easy to Google the ingredients where I've seen people say, oh, you know how to make a witch bottle. You add like vinegar and rusty nails. And it's like, okay, no, hold on a second. If you Google those two things, they will create a chemical um, reaction and it will explode after time. Um, so it's probably not a good idea. Uh, or, you know, there's just a couple of things that you're are relatively easy to Google. Other tools to decipher misinformation. Gosh, it's kind of difficult. I think personally as a creator, it's a little bit, there's there's a little bit more leeway because I can actually, I have a lot of contacts. Um, meanwhile, you know, community members that I'm able to ask and basically verify. So for example, I remember, and this is a little bit of like ruffling feathers potentially. I remember when the Ukraine war first started, all of a sudden, a lot of people were suddenly Ukrainian, even though in none of their content has ever, ever, ever revolved around this topic. And suddenly they, you know, their name is in Cyrillic and they are posting about like Ukrainian folklore, for example. And it's like, there's comments that are like calling this person out of like regular consumers that are saying, this is misinformation. I'm from Ukraine, this is misinformation. And then they get deleted. <laughs> or, you know, the, the, the creator never uh, ver like um, 
what's it called? They never go back and like take that video down and like update it or anything like that, right? Um, and that I think for, that's that's so problematic for so many reasons. That's that's like the height of taking advantage of a situation and like capitalizing off a horrible situation. I think there is a level of like holding each other accountable with a community essentially. So for example, I have um, acquaintances that are in Ukraine, this is just this example, um, where I'm able to ask them, hey, is this true? Um, reading the comments and being able to see like, hey, hold on a second, um, a lot of people here that are from that region are saying this is misinformation. Now let's take, for example, German magic and German folklore or specifically Southern. Um, I've seen videos that are, or even, you know, like pieces of blogs and stuff like that, um, that are talking about a subject that I know about that are just wrong information. So I think community is a great one here. So if you are part of a witchcraft community, I think being diverse actually is great because if you have members of different cultural backgrounds, you are able to go to them for help and advice and verification. And I think that's a great way, but I think there's a couple of other steps that um, could also potentially be of benefit. I'm probably not going to be able to cover all of that. That might, buy, might be a video for itself though. So I think that's a really, really great topic. How does a large following impact the perception of the creator? <laughs> oh boy, um, does this immediately make them an expert or are there other assumptions as to why they may have a large following? This is also a topic of itself, but this one is one that bothers me personally a lot too because I've seen people blow up on Instagram. I'm just using Instagram as an example. Um, and it is not because they're an expert. It's not because they're an authority. However, now they might seem that way because of the large following. It's absolutely true that a large following seems like they are an authority or that they know what they're talking about. Um, and that's just not the case. Realistically speaking, from like a marketing standpoint, it's quite easy to grow on Instagram. I know people always say it's not, but to be honest, it is if you understand Instagram. And so the only thing that a large following proves is an understanding of how Instagram works. Um, and the secret really is, and I'll tell you the secret of like how to grow on Instagram, you need a good quality camera you need a nice setup and you need to post consistently for at least a month. Um, so let's say you have a person, they wanna become like an influencer or a creator or whatever. Uh, if you have a good camera and you have a nice setup, so for example, you've had the money to, uh, you know, get yourself a good looking sort of altar space. Um, and then you post a video three times a week and that video is less than 30 seconds long and that video is edited in the Instagram app and that video includes like text on screen um, with clickbaity words or like words that trigger the algorithm such as witchcraft, folklore, you know, those, those words that are currently like on trend as well. Um, and you edit a little video together, uh, that's all it really takes, to be honest with you. Um, there's, that's, that's the secret. And so someone can do that. They can take this sort of recipe and become a big influencer and they have 140,000 whatever followers and, but there's no actual substance in their posts. That's, it's, it's, it's a lot of times the same thing over and over again, just out of a different angle. Um, it's a lot of times that sort of thing. But the problem herein lies in that because they do have that large audience, people will start looking up to them. People will start um, seeing and following, obviously, um, and thinking that this person knows what they're talking about because they're posting these videos, these how-to videos, these witch tips, um, what have you. And a lot of times it's dangerous or mis like misinformation. Um, and it can, as a matter of fact, become dangerous if these people are giving advice that is unfounded or even harmful to a certain degree. Um, I've seen a lot of content that make me shake my head. Um, and then there's straight up content that is like harmful, that would put someone at risk, like health risk. And the problem here is I've been blocked by some people that I've, you know, been called, I've, I've called them out or, you know, whatever. And then it's like, well, how are you gonna call them out now if, you, if they've blocked you? And you see that a lot of times too, where someone that is problematic 
someone i've had one person for example that i did say hey hold on a second this is harmful for the environment like you pouring a bottle of alcohol and a bottle of like honey into a still standing body of water that's harmful that's harmful for that environment um and they got blocked so <laughs> you know there's that um but yeah there definitely is that connotation of like a large following um being being a form of authority or being an expert. Um, how does one maintain the balance of authenticity and content creation? Uh, I think, and this is kind of my personal take on it, this is what I kind of personally have, you know, devised for myself is if I post something, I don't want it to be made up. I don't want it to be something that I just started doing yesterday. Um, and I will take care to ask myself uh, a couple of like those questions like am I posting this what's the purpose of me posting this um, and so for example book book suggestion videos if I post a video and it has book suggestions in it I will try to make sure that I've actually read the book so I'm not just suggesting it because it has a pretty cover or because I got sent it this kind of goes even for into sponsorships and such things you know like uh, the amount of sponsorship people that come to me and they're like hi we would like to sponsor your video and it's like has nothing to do with my content or it's it's a cheap product from you know like it's just not a good product I don't stand by that product um is I don't take those. As a matter of fact, like most of the things that you see me kind of promote, I get them, um, I don't get paid to post that. The only company that I've ever actually closely worked with that actually paid me, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, <laughs> is Aura, um, the meditation app. Um, that's the only one, basically, uh, that I can think of. So for example, if I work with or promote another company, especially on Instagram, it tends to be um, a mutual exchange. So for example, I love their products uh, and then I will post them because I actually genuinely love them. And then they get a little bit of, you know, like uh, reach through me, but it's, it's a mutual sort of exchange. Um, I get free product and they get views, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think there is that balance of just like making sure that it feels authentic to you and you don't feel like guilty or anything for posting something like that or that it's just for views and it's actually not something that you actually stand by. Um, that's just my personal take on it. Another one, for example, is it stolen content. That one pisses me off um, for obvious reasons. Um, there's creators that will really, really steal content, repackage it a little bit um, and call it their own. They are piggybacking off of the work of other people. They've made an entire, you know, audience out of that. Um, and then when you call them out, they spin the narrative, they're the victim, um, they block you. Uh, they tell their friends that, you know, they're this poor victim in a situation. Uh, and a lot of times it's really, really infuriating because they are really, really great at manipulating and um, spinning it in a way that you as the person that is being stolen from, you are able to recognize these things, but a casual viewer might not so much and they use that to their advantage. So I think there is a, there is a lot of that happening too. Imposter, I have 18 minutes left. Imposter syndrome and FOMO. When I follow other creators in the community space, does it make me feel genuinely inspired and empowered or does it create feelings of FOMO on being less than? Yeah. Personally, I definitely get that. Um, it's something that every once in a while I have phases where this is something that I need to work through. Luckily, I do have a really, really great support system that will help me kind of like work through that when I do have those feelings come up. But there have certainly been moments where I hesitated from posting something because I'm worried that it's not, it's not good enough or you know, that other creators will kind of be like, oh, what, what is this? You know, that type of thing. Um, so sometimes I also see content that definitely makes me kind of feel like I'm not good enough um, in terms of, for example, like, I don't know. There's just, I mean, first of all, there is content where it makes me kind of doubt myself as a practitioner. And I have to remind myself like, no, 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 hold on. You know how content creation works. You know that people exaggerate a lot of times online, you know? Um, 
there's there's times where um, practitioners will say oh I have this really crazy well to me crazy <laughs> routine and like there comes that moment of doubt where I'm like am I not good enough of a practitioner because I am not able to um, out of just time constraint for example um, practice every morning and every evening and have you know this like long one hour meditation for example right I'm just making stuff up at this point but where I'm like, well, I can't do that. Um, for a couple of different reasons, I can't do that. So therefore, am I less than? Am I never going to be able to reach that level of like advancement, let's say? Um, definitely. Then I definitely get FOMO as well, where I feel like, you know, something, for example, blows up, like there's a specific product that blows up, there's a book that blows up, there's um, a tarot deck that blows up um, or what have you. And I feel like I also need to get that. And then I'm like, oh my God, that's so, you know, everyone has it. I'm clearly missing out. Like, this is clearly the best thing ever. And it's funny because I've kind of noticed that a lot of times, especially with books, it's just a good marketing technique for the most part. Um, I've seen books blow up and then I dipped and I, I gave in to that FOMO. And then I'm like, this is not that great. Um, or alternatively, some books really are that great. But I definitely have fallen victim <laughs> to that too. Um, Sometimes it definitely happens. Now, I will say there are also creators that make me feel really, really great. I think there is definitely creators that I love seeing their things. I feel so inspired seeing their content. It makes me want to actually like put the phone down and get to it right away. Definitely too. I think this, this video may have been a little bit negative up until this point. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but I think there's a lot of creators that actually do make me feel um, really, really good too. And that I think you can tell that their intention translates into, um, like their positive intention actually translates into that positivity where it does feel um, really supportive and it feels like really good. For sure, that exists as well. If I experience FOMO, has it ever left me feeling vulnerable to be taken advantage of financially or otherwise? I feel, I feel like I've already answered that. Um, uh, an example would be the need to purchase the latest popular product or book to fill in, yes. But I think I've already answered that. When practicing my craft, do I find myself comparing what I do to what I've been seeing people do online? I used to do that a lot more often. Um, there's definitely a couple of people where it's a funny relationship where I look up to them, but then I also compare myself to them, for example, where I'm like, oh my gosh, this person has such an array of knowledge. Like, I feel like I just don't have that knowledge, for example, right? Um, like, they're just so well-spoken or they seem to have all this information on a topic that I thought I knew about and then they post something and I knew nothing about that topic. And so I'm like, oh no, <laughs> definitely for sure too. Um, but you know, I feel like there's a lot of comparison in that regard going on, not just for me. I'm sure there's other people that feel that way too. Um, in what ways do I combat, combat imposter syndrome? Um, I tend to talk about it. I tend to have, you know, especially Leah, for example, um, we tend to talk about these things and that tends to really help. So I kind of rely once again on community. Um, where I fall back on having a support system. Um, if I do feel a real strong sense of imposter syndrome, I personally do take a break. I try to kind of be like, okay, I need to take myself out of the situation um, so that I'm not in that echo chamber where you are easily like, hysteria creates itself really, really easily, right? It's like this kind of like rat race, you step out of it. And I feel like that helps me personally a lot where I take a couple of days off, for example, or um, I go read a book. <laughs> um, that helps me a lot to just focus on something else. Um, and that tends to help me personally a lot. What would my practice look like without the social media influence or other creators? I think very different. Um, I, I almost wonder if I would still be Wiccan. I'm not sure. Perhaps, I guess we'll never know. But I think my influence, my craft has definitely been influenced by social media, um, but I feel like mostly in a positive way where social media and the online community has allowed me to um, see a couple of practices or for example, take note of certain things that I, I was doing wrong or things that I could um, become better in. 
Um, I, for example, discovered, well, I didn't discover it, but you know, for myself, um, folk magic over social media. And, you know, seeing books, for example, being presented that I hadn't heard anything of prior. Um, and so therefore I went out and bought these books or read these books and they have really, really heavily changed my practice as a matter of fact. So I think overall it's been a good influence. However, there's definitely been moments um, where Again, FOMO, imposter syndrome has been paralyzing. Uh, also, I think I spend way too much, m m I have my screen time is crazy. It's really bad. And so I think that has definitely impacted my practice a lot too, where I think if social media was not as, as much, let's say, if there wasn't constantly new content being consumable, um, I think I put my phone down a little, and this is my own like discipline issue, I suppose, but it's just so easy to scroll, you know? I mean, it's like literally psychologically, the, the way that this app is created is to psychologically like pull you in, you know, like all these notifications pop up to pull you back in, um, to get you to spend more time on their app. Um, so I feel like if I was able to resist that a little bit more, I feel like I could spend more time actually practicing rather than consuming, that's for sure. I have 10 more minutes left, so <laughs> I'm gonna have a look real quick if I can complete this. Do I consider online communities as equally valid to in-person communities? I would say yes and no. I feel like they're different. I don't, I think they're just very, very different. I think their purposes are very different. Um, however, I feel like it's kind of comparing apples and pears. I would say that if one has the possibility to have an in-person community, absolutely do that. Cause I think it, it adds a lot to you as a practitioner. Um, whereas, you know, in-person communities, they tend to be a little bit more practical. And I feel like online communities are a little bit more theoretical. So I think that's probably, you know, um, in terms of validity, I feel like that's probably I don't know, personal, I think this is up to like the, the individual person. Um, personally, I just feel like you can't compare them. How have online occult witchcraft communities impacted me as a person and practitioner? I feel like I've already kind of answered that. What are some of the dangers of the current phenomena of capitalizing off of the witchcraft community? Have I been personally affected by this or have I witnessed someone else be affected? Yes, so this one is, and I think I'll close with this. Um, I feel like there's a lot of consumption going on right now. Everyone's trying to sell you something. Everyone's got, you know, um, bath salts and simmer pots and all that good stuff that they're trying to sell you. And I think people forget that a lot of times there's a lot of power in making these things yourself. Um, there's a lot more energy if you infuse these things with your own energy. Um, there's courses being sold left and right and there's such a like array of, it's almost like when you go into the grocery store I remember one time going into an American grocery store and there's there's, there, there's like 50 flavors of Oreos. And it's like, I don't know which one to pick. Um, and it's kind of that thing again, where I feel like there is such an overcapitalization and like overconsumption, almost to the point of like, um, you know, gluttony <laughs> in a funny way, you know, where it's like, okay, hold on a second is you buying this thing, is you getting getting all these different tools. They don't make you more of a witch. They don't make you more valid. Having these things doesn't make you be a more advanced practitioner. Practicing makes you a more advanced practitioner and you don't need anything necessarily. Like you don't need to be buying all these things that you don't really need, you know? Like I get being a collector, I'm obviously also a little bit of a hoarder and collector myself. But I think there comes a point where people are trying to sell you so many products and it's like, oh my gosh, you know? I think there's a lot of danger in that. I think there's a lot of taking advantage of, of people that are beginners, people that are new, people that don't know any better, that think you need to buy all of these things to be a witch because that's what they see these big accounts have, these big creators have, you know? And it's like, no, hold on a second. Like, yes, you do need certain tools to draw energy from. However, you can find most of these, 99% of these out in nature. Like, you don't need to spend money to be a witch. You, in my opinion, I don't think you do. I don't think you do at all. 
Um, I think the best teachers are the spirits outside that you go meet with, you know, in the forests. Um, yes, of course, there are certain books that I definitely think are worth the money. And that's probably the only one where I personally am willing to spend a lot of money on. Um, and then there's a couple of artists and crafts where I'm like, that's gorgeous. That is, you know, like a collector item. But I think there's a lot of danger in having like 30 different tarot decks or spending money on something that you could very, very easily make yourself and that is more potent. But I think a lot of marketing strategy with these people is, I'm such an expert. Let me sell you this bath sold. Um, let me sell you this floor scrub, um, you know, because I'm such an expert. And it's like, and then people think that their product isn't to the same quality of this creator's product. And I think there's a lot of danger in that. And I think there's a lot of, of that happening in the community um, or where it's like, oh, you know, if you take this course, then you are officially certified, a certified witch. There is a lot of danger in that too, I think. Um, and I think our community is, and I think this is a big factor in like the new age community too. And I think our community is heading more and more towards that new age. You know, we, we always talk so bad about the new age, but I think we're moving more and more towards that, um, you know, pyramid scheme type of situation. Um, but yeah, so I think that is probably where I'm going to finish the video here. Um, again, I feel like this conversation could go on and on and on and on and on. And perhaps I will make a part two. Perhaps I'll do like a podcast episode or something on this or a blog post, blog post over on my Patreon, whatever. Um, we'll see. But I would love to hear from you. You guys are the community. So I know that sometimes people are shy to make a video, especially if they've never done a video before, if you've, if you've never made a post or anything like that before, but you guys are the community. So I feel like it is essential to hear from you because you are, you know, like there would, it's like there would be no forest without the trees. So I would love for you to take part in this. Um, the tag is occult tea. Uh, and the questions are down in the description box. I believe there's like a Patreon post that is public um, with all of these prompts um, and notes and all that good stuff. Um, you're also more than welcome to please leave a comment in the section down below, obviously in the, in the comment section, um, or, you know, engage in any other way that you feel comfortable on Instagram, make a podcast episode, whatever you feel you have access to. Um, but yeah. So I hope that this kind of maybe started a conversation, maybe some self-reflection. I know that for me, when I saw Joanna's post, it was very self-reflective, um, prompted that self-reflection for me. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this lengthy, lengthy <laughs> uh, rambly session um, and that you got something out of it for yourself. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching. May you walk with your gods. Bye.